I've known Kamari, now Kamari that he's old. Since he was a child, he was always mischievous, inquisitive, and very energetic. He grew up in an environment that was involved in African religion and culture. So he lived the traditions of the Akan and God people of Ghana. As a young man, he lived in Ghana for a while. And when he returned, he started the Asafo group. It became a part of the Basul Jamawaji, the religious organization his father created, and it became an integral part of what we did. All of the men and boys, I forgot. I can't read without glasses. <laughs> All of the men and boys came to participate, and Kamadi taught them the drumming, music, dancing, and rituals of the Asafa. He shared what he learned, and it had a very positive influence on everyone. The whole community was very much impressed by his accomplishments. I wrote this, and while I was writing this, I was remembering that when Kamai graduated from high school, he was supposed to go to college. He avoided it. And I always found it absolutely amazing that this young man that everybody wanted to push into an academic group knew in his heart that was not for him. He was the kind of person that anything anyone showed him or did in front of him, he could remember. And he had a very special way of studying things. In the house, there were books all over the place. And he was systematically going through all of those books. Now, for somebody who was interested in academics, I found it fascinating that he read more than any other child I had ever seen. He not only read, but then he would converse. And when people think they can't learn something from a child, think again. You can learn a lot, believe me, just by the questions that they ask. And that was the case with Kamadi. Because when he asked the question, most of the time, you were stumped at first. You really had to think hard or research to answer his question. And that in itself I found fascinating. Um, when he created Protocol Society, and he created his own group, and he would perform, and he came up with the idea of organic music. And I said, Kamadi, what is organic music? He said, nature. It's natural music. And then he showed me an instrument he had where when he twisted it, it sounded like rainfall. And that was his, his innovation for music. I thought it was fantastic, because I had never heard anyone speak in that way before. The strange thing about it is just a couple of weeks ago, I picked up the Dillard's Voice, and there's a group out there um, billing themselves as organic musicians. <laughs> and I said, so many years ago, this was his idea. Who knows, in the circle of life, they picked it up along the way. I always admired his persistence in studying and seeking out information he felt was relevant to what he wanted to do. And that was one of the things that his father always said, see all, hear all, but only seek that which concerns you. And he epitomized that. He was respected and praised for his accomplishments as a musician by his community and commercially by the music industry. During the first rite of passage in God tradition, 
we have the outdoor room. And a part of the prayer that is said is, what is today? Today is Thursday. Grandfather Thursday, Grandmother Thursday. Today we show the stranger who sojourns with us to the morning star. Nana Kamadi has completed his sojourn with us. We gather here today to help him travel on. The part of him that was given by Almighty God will go back to Almighty God. Asasaya, the earth, will accept his body. Through our memories of him, we will share and hold the part that he gave to us through his music, conversations, innovations, and through his children. A part of him will always be with us. writing in his pad, he was writing down who he wanted to speak to. And he said, be sure and get Dr. Jeffries and Professor Small, because I want them to speak for me today. So I said, well, why didn't Nana come to me? We talk nearly every night, two, three in the morning, Facebooking and going to bed. So last night he came. And when he came last night, he said, I want you to write the book of instructions. I was like, what book of instructions? So he gave me all of this stack of yellow pads and pencil. So now I have to figure out this book of instructions. And then we went walking, and there was a big ocean. So Nana decided he wanted to swim. And he began to swim way out. And then the water started splashing. And I told the brother who was standing with me, I didn't know who he was. I said, is there a boat? Because Nana's going up pretty far and he kept going. And so he turned when the guy said, there's no boat. So Nana turned and said in the dream, he said, don't you see me swimming? Call me back. And then he laughed. And the man, I said, go get him. And the person who was with us walked on the water to go get him. That's the spirit world. Spirit is in transition. Not as on his journey. You know? He was with us a short time, but he probably lived more lives than most of us combined. He taught us when we weren't listening. He showed us and we weren't listening. Maybe let's listen now that he's in the spirit world. He's an ancestor now. The divine in Yami just took off a tiny piece of itself and threw it to us, and it was called Kimati. And now it's been called back. He did his work. He didn't go too soon. I've never been so confused in my life. I've been a priest or a man most of my adult life. And I'm used to death like nobody's business. But this confused me because I didn't expect him. I was looking forward to seeing him this week. But we have no choice in the matter. Destiny is determined when we leave home, when the work is done. And we've given our blessing, as Nana gave his blessing, to this world, his teaching, his music, his spiritual understanding his effort to build Pan-Africanism using culture at the center. That's what the museum is about. How do you take 
the depth of our culture can advance the Pan-African movement to try and create a fusion, an aggregate for black people. Let's listen to our Nana. He wasn't just our friend and brother, he was our king. This is our king. Many of us was at his installment when he was made our king, when Nana of Arabia came to do the work. So our king has traveled to his village. We love you, dear king. Peace and rest. And we want to give the ancestors a chance to, you know, teach them what to do on the other side. So we give them a resting period, and there's certain rituals that are performed during this time. And then after a year, we have a big IEA celebration because we believe it takes about a year for the spirit to trans transfer, to transition. I know Brother Kimadi ain't going to rest in peace, so I'm saying travel peacefully, brother, and work for us when you get to the other side. <laughs> I'd like, before I say anything, I'd like you to look around the room. Maybe if, you, if you're at the front, the children especially, stand up and look around the room. Please, not as children. Because I was sitting at the front. Wow. Yes, wow indeed. You know, when I saw this, I did the hallway. The stream crosses the path. Path crosses the stream. Which of them is the elder? Did we not cut a path to go and meet this stream? The stream had its origins long, long ago. It had its origin in the Creator. He created things. Pure, pure Tano. Rifia Tano. If you have gone elsewhere, come. For we seek your path. That's the beginning of the awakening. It's a drum proverb, a drum text, a part of history which has been pretty much unchanged, unchanged for centuries. It talks about the beginning. It talks about seniority, that God comes first. What's created by nature, what's created by God, always comes before what's created by man. Which came first? Which is the elder? The stream is the elder. The stream is pure. Tano was reference to the shrine Tano, the river Tano, and the whole plethora of, of deities that come from that river. When Nana came back, when Nana Kamadi came back from Ghana in 1979, uh, I left, or 78, I left in 79 to go and live in Albany. So we didn't have much time together, but one of the things he told me was, he was showing me some drum texts, and he said, for a tune band you'll use the awakening. It's the beginning of it, and I researched it and found what it meant. historian, writer, lecturer, teacher, father, and son of Africa, but not in that order. Son of Africa comes first. Because it's son of Africa that he drummed about, whose history he collected, what he wrote about, what he lectured about, what he taught, and what he, what he imbued in his children. Son of Africa is the source. There's a school of thought that seems to say that in African traditional religion, those curious attributes should be put to the back shelf. They should be put in the kitchen behind the glassware that you never touch. Or they should be relegated to a, a shelf or a glass case where artifacts of dying cultures go to reside. There are people who will say that. Europeans said that when they came to Africa, and many Africans say that today. 
there's a tendency not to understand the value of the culture. And you would think that people who want that want Africans in Africa, in South America, in the Caribbean, here in America, to go and commit a kind of racial suicide, which would be no less fatal because it was only spiritual. Nana Kimati continued the work of his father and his mother in maintaining a spiritual tradition which stood in stark defiance of that belief. He led in word and in deed. He led by example. He faced the travails that all of us face living in a contemporary American or European society. Bills need to get paid. Cars need gas. Whatever. But if you ever visited with him, a few of the things that you'll recall. First of all, the speed and authenticity and, and sincerity of his laugh. <laughs> he could laugh loud and quickly yes. and share it with you, which I think speaks more about his character than anything. Because he could be angry one minute and find something amusing in the very next second. <laughs> which let you know that he wouldn't let the thing that angered him possess him. And another thing was that you could go in there on a Friday afternoon thinking that you're going to drop off something and leave the car <laughs> oh, So you know, you were there. <laughs> And you don't emerge until Sunday night. <laughs> or you emerge Sunday night saying, oh, I have to go to work, I have to go to work, I have to go to work. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. It's like a vortex in that house when you're around it. You don't get out. And it got to the point where myself and several others would say, are you going to another comment? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I want to see him and he got his thing over there, but I, I, don't, I can't go, I can't get out. <laughs> well, we love being with him, and we learn so much from him, and yes, we're going to miss him, but all right, everything everyone said, I agree with, I mean, it really is, I'm happy that the things that were expressed were expressed the way they were. I think that we've, we've all shared common experiences with Nana Kamati. And we all recognize that while he has been gone much, much, much sooner than we wanted, and much sooner than we expected, certainly, I, I don't know anybody far older than him who accomplished a fraction of what he accomplished. If you took a look at his passport, you would have a sense of some of the places he visited. When he traveled with different groups, when you went to his house and you looked at them working on the archives, or when you when you were sitting through some of the recording sessions, or when you're going over when he's going over some of the shrine work that he did done, it just never seems to stop. He lived a full life. I remember I remember reading about it's funny that, that you mentioned about he was not he didn't go to college, but he stayed with academic scholars and academicians. Okay. The same theory about how to attribute curious aspects of traditional African religion also said that education was key. When the Europeans came to Africa, one of the things they tried to do was to educate the people. Education to them meant go to the university and get a degree. And some people who observed that recognized that people who became educated had to, as a necessity, divorce themselves to some degree from their own culture from their country, from their language, from their people. They either had to travel or they had to go to the city. They had to embrace different ways. So there's always a price to pay. And once you recognize that there is a price to pay, it helps you weigh the decision about whether or not it's worth it. So for Nana Kamadi to recognize at that time that, no, this wasn't worth it, it was a wise choice for us all, and even wiser for him. And we applaud the fact that he had the courage to stand by that commitment. 
So there's a lesson in that for us all. I, as a father who encouraged my children to go to school, now don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you children to tell your parents, now that Gracie said we shouldn't go to school. <laughs> no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the context of his upbringing allowed him to acquire knowledge and apply it in the right way. His father, Nana Denizula the first, used to say, if you don't teach your children what you want them to know, somebody else is going to teach them what they want them to know. So, what Nana Adjua spoke about, the upbringing in that household, it created a context, a reality, that Nana Kamadi was able to say, all right, if I take information from here, I take information from there, I can do what I need to do. And the same observations about the introduction of education in traditional Africa and colonial Africa and how the, the effect that it had on children there recognize that uneducated and untutored Africans still retain some indefinable quality, some strength that placed them head and shoulders above the rest, a sense of confidence as though they were linked somehow because of the adherence to their culture, to their past. A hand from the past seemed to hold on to them and guide them. These were Europeans writing this. And this was their observations to one another about the effect of education and the effect of culture in colonial Africa. I don't think it's a mystery. Education is relatively new for African Americans. It's not something that we've enjoyed very much down through the centuries. And our culture and our communities have retained strength and cohesiveness. So while I'm not saying not to go to school, I am saying we have to reinforce the context that our children see themselves, in which our children see themselves. And the culture is the way to do that. And if I said nothing else, I would say that Nana Yao Kimati Denizulu has taught all of us something. He's left something here for each of us. And the same way you'll pick up a dandelion and it has a thousand little pieces of fluff and you blow it in the air and it, it scatters to the wind and each of those seeds could land somewhere and plant something. When we lose a leader, any great person who has contributed to society, it's the same thing. We need to be cognizant of the fact that he's left thousands of ideas. He's paved thousands of little roads by the things that he's done, which is part of the things that consumed him because he was always doing more and more and more. But we need to capture those ideas. We can't let them evaporate. We need to instill them in our children or follow them ourselves and cultivate them because in each of them is something great. And uh, 50 years from now and 100 years from now, we can have 50 Nana Kamadi Dinazulus. Because the things that enabled him to achieve some of the things that he did, other than the strength of his personality and the uniqueness of his character, was the environment that he was in, was the context that he was raised in, was what his, his parents, his family, the community around him nurtured him in that way, reinforced the confidence that he had. The observation about the untutored Africans who were uneducated but still retained a sense of self-confidence that was unparalleled, that they couldn't understand why, it's not hard to understand. Europeans have enjoyed that for a long time. An unbroken contu continuity with their ancestry. So, let's do that. Let's commit to do that for Nana Kamadi. That he lived his life not only for himself, his achievements were his own, but he lived his life for us. He lived his life for each of you. Each of you who are here are here for a reason because he came in contact with you in some, in some way. He came in contact with you in some way. And you appreciated that enough to come out here and remember him today. But there's more to do than that. So we have a 40 day right that will come and a one year right that will come because the memory of somebody who has done something great should not dissipate quickly. We reinforce that. We reinforce that and that's how we make ancestors. So that's part of our job. But the other part is to take the work that he started and find your own. Find your own and build upon it and develop it and develop it in his name. He deserves that. He deserves that. He does. 
and I'm going to miss you. And I'm sorry that I haven't seen you for a while. I spent some time with him the past few weeks, and so I was very surprised at his passing. And as I said, even then, he was talking about the things he was going to do when he got home. He, every time, I'll, I'll be home in a couple of weeks, I think two weeks, and people let me out of here, blah, blah, blah. And then we got to do this, and oh, Santo, don't forget, we got to call so and so, and write this down. And he was going, and then he would joke, and he would laugh. And I said, oh, well, yeah, he lost a lot of weight. He doesn't look that good, but his spirit is the same. Mm -hmm. His mind is sharp. I saw him and saw him said, his mind is sharp as a tack. So I didn't expect this. I didn't expect this, but, you know, it's here. So, you know, we do what we have to do. And what we have to do is what he did. So we'll move on. And now, thank you. I said to him, Santo, you were there. Where are you? No, there you are. I said to him the first time I saw him in the rehab center, and I was, you know, sort of surprised. But I couldn't leave without telling him. I said, Nani, you are the most positive person I've ever met in my life. I said, since I've known you, if I ever had a problem, I, not that I brought the problem to you, but that you even knew I had it, you would always come up with a suggestion, a solution a positive way that I could get out of it, that I could overcome it, that I could achieve it. If we're just sitting around talking, you're coming up with ideas and, and more things for me to do, then I can keep up with it. I just want you to have some of that positive feeling about yourself now. And I'm going to pray for you every day. And I want you to pray for yourself in that way, in the hope that optimism brings good results. Because those of you who know him know that he was an optimist. He was an optimist. I said recently that the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, and an optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. That defines Donna Kamadi. So that he's not here now only means that his work was done. And all those things he was telling me he wanted to do this and he wanted to do that and he wanted to, somebody else said, no, it's not time. You've done more than most can do. And all of us here, and more who are not here, love him for it.